had only betrayed or it was in prospect that he was only going to betray technical sources of information and we were not in war, then no, it would not be justified to kill him. But inasmuch as Anderson had killed already, and given the way he responded the last time he was asked to cease and desist in that kind of activity, it was sort of a given in the problem that he would indeed continue this conduct and he would kill again, that then yes, in order to protect the lives of our people abroad, we would be justified in a homicide. I so recommended, but the White House said no to severe a sanction. For that reason, Anderson still lives. Were he to walk here now, he would continue to live. Of course, he doesn't do that sort of thing anymore. He has learned that it can be hazardous to your health. Carol, I'd like to comment on that. I think this man used the word kill, 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 Jack Anderson kill, Jack Anderson kill about 11 times. I heard no evidence here that Jack Anderson killed anybody. And that whole controversy about, I think it was the guy in Athens, was it? Or that, but in any case, this charge uh, that Jack Anderson killed somebody is totally false. Liddy was willing to kill Jack Anderson because of this false charge. There's much controversy about that. Uh, uh, publishing information is certainly something that um, uh, under no circumstances should be penalized by assassination. Uh, this notion of assigning homicidal and murderous acts to someone who's done that is exactly the danger because he could then say, well, LSD killed um, Art Linkletter's daughter, which it didn't, by the way. And then he could, uh, you know, uh, he could kill me. Uh, we have plenty of laws in this country. We have too many laws in this country. And uh, certainly murder is well covered by laws. So if Jack Anderson really did kill anyone, uh, let's bring him to trial. It's called the American Way, Gordon. Jack Anderson did cause the death of someone else, but it was not the fellow in Athens. It was the fellow over in, I think, Pakistan. We don't know that. You event. see, the CIA in could event, have done that. I want to point out that in, in those days, there was no other alternative. There were no laws which would reach that kind of conduct by Mr. Anderson. Since then, the Congress of the United States has indeed passed a law which would reach that conduct, and such an occasion uh, would not rise under the present law because he would be prosecuted under that law. And that would take care of that situation. What's most important to you? Loyalty. Loyalty. Uh, how far would you go with loyalty? Up to, but exclusive, of Malamin, say. Which means evil Something in itself. Evil, evil in itself. And that's by your own definition of what's Malamin. It has say. to be. Each of us acts according to our own conscience. But, but if it's if each of us is acting according to our own conscience, then we can really get in a lot of trouble because we may see it quite differently. Well, what's true. What evil in that, itself that is, is to you may not be evil in itself to me. That's correct. But you see, I'm not going to accept your definition. I'm going to accept mine, nor would I insist that you accept mine. Well, that's not true. I mean, you were willing to kill people in order to accept your definition. No, I, I was willing to kill people when it was for what I believed to be a good reason. In other words, I had taken a prudential judgment. Uh, obviously, in World War II, the Germans, whose motto was Gott mit uns, meaning God is with us, believed in their cause. Obviously, the British and the Americans believed in theirs. You had two opposing viewpoints, and history was written by the victors. You know, but the, but the point still remains that you talk about the fact that when you were um, burglaring Ellsberg's office or Fielding's office, that had someone come along and got in your way, you'd have done anything you could uh, short of killing him or her, um, but you would not allow that person to get in the way of your goal, which was to rob Fielding's office and get Ellsberg's files. Now, if I had been walking Correction. down the street... We were going to photograph him. We weren't going to take them. Okay. If I had been walking down the street at that time, and I just simply noticed this, I wasn't going to go away, and I said, I, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm going to call, call the police. There's a burglar going on there. You have stated in a Playboy interview you would have killed me. No, killing, by definition, is not malum in se. You are breaking several laws. Heaven which, forfend. And, uh, well, I think I'd ought to be thought about, G. Gordon Liddy. Of course I think the about laws. it. I think about it very carefully before I elect to do so. Depending upon how important is the law, uh, the degree of thought that I give it. I find it just 
terribly difficult to think that I could be your victim because I happened to walk along the street while you were co committing a burglary. I cannot find You could get run over by a truck. But that isn't... <laughs> Of course I could, but that's an accident. That's not by your design, because I'm in your way as you are carrying on an illegal burglar. I you mean, would, I, th the, uh, that is I a killing of an innocent person. The way I would view it, yeah. Well, innocent people do die in battle, and the way I would view it is you, you would be not in my way, you'd be in the way of our country. Well, that's how you view it. Yeah. I view you in the way of our country, going into uh, people's offices and stealing. I, I understand okay. that, but I'm not so terribly concerned with how you view it. Because what counts to me is how I view it, not how you view it. Oh, well, Because I'm, I'm inner directed, not other directed. Okay. For, unfortunately, how you view it results in actions in this world of that affect other people. Of course. Supposing um, your son were the person in your way, and your son said, uh-uh, Dad, I'm not moving. I'm back. The minute I leave here, I'm going to call the police. What you're saying is, is there a circumstance in which I would kill my son? And of course there is. And that but by the same, But by the same token, uh, I know my son, and, and I do not find uh, a likely prospect. So that your loyalty to your country supersedes loyalty to anything else? You have to. Now, does that loyalty to your country include um, loyalty to uh, President Carter, for example, when he was... Okay? I would never have done the Watergate burglary for President Carter. I would do the fielding burglary for President Carter or any other president of the United States, because it had nothing to do with politics. It had to do with the security of the United States. Now that uh, we've killed a few people off, what do you think happens after death? Nothing. Nothing. So how do you live your life? To the fullest. In every way? What do you think about love? By definition, it's an act of the will. Do you love your wife? Yes. How long are you married? It will be 25 years in November. You selected her, not necessarily on the basis of romantic love. Correct. On what basis did you select her? The progeny that would result from the union. And why was she selected? Well, I examined myself and I said, you know, what are your strong points and what are your weak points? Now, what I met was a woman who's five feet, nine inches tall, whose father was uh, in excess of six feet and a champion athlete, and who, as I do crossword puzzles, does differential calculus for amusement. When the FBI transferred me to uh, Indianapolis, IBM transferred her to Indianapolis because they had just sold their mainframe computers. That's the biggest stuff they've got. She went out there, wired all those computers, and then taught the United States government how to use them. And she was then 26. She's a math genius. The best way I've heard it expressed is by a, a Hindu couple who said to me, you in the West marry those whom you love. We in the East love those whom we marry. So you grew into really a, a more loving relationship. Do you think that monogamy is possible in uh, our modern world? It's possible. It's very hard. How about for you? Very hard. What does your wife think about that? How does she feel about she, that? Uh, she's aware of it. Uh, she's not terribly happy about it. She uh, finds ways to deal with it. Mm -hmm. What if she fell off the wagon? Would you divorce her over it or anything? No, I haven't. No. no. Okay. What would you divorce her over? Would there be anything? Uh, oh, she would, you know, betray our country or something like that, sure. What about Gordon's sex life? Yes, what about Gordon's sex life? Never mind, Gordon. You're the one who said something about Gordon's sex life. You're the expert on Gordon's sex life. Well, I, you keep telling me it's all in my imagination. Right. Well, thank yes. you. <laughs> His sex life is in your imagination. imagination. I create this, this large good bevy of women that are following him everywhere. And um, I, I certainly, well, I, I think with the media and the, and the press people, and I just, when you pick up the phone at home, <clears throat> and some woman's voice come on, and she is so sure of herself and so arrogant, and she says, I wish to speak to G. Gordon Liddy. And you say, well, I'm sorry, he's not there. Could I take a message? Well, she said, I must speak to Mr. Liddy right away. Like, who are you standing in the way of my phone call? They have this, I don't know, there's something about the age group. Their whole attitude. Now, they probably just want an interview. And then that's interesting when they come for the interview. And they sit there and they have a little wine and she inches further and further over on the sofa. And Gordon never introduces me to her. And, uh, is that right? I, 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 
There's never been an interview like this. I oh, mean, yes, this there is. in your head. Honey, that interview was done by uh, People magazine about three months ago. They're notorious trollops. <laughs> 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 oh, hell, oh, yeah. They'll do anything, those girls, for a story. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you're you know, trouble, women do women have that they I tell you a woman instinctively knows those signals so quickly and you men are totally slow and ridiculous picking it up I know the second a woman is going to be difficult with me well I just want I just want to make one thing perfectly clear here coin of phrase I'm pleading not guilty on all of this all right well you always have okay. that's why they gave you 20 years <laughs> he also refuses to talk <laughs> exactly 20 more I was uh, delighted the other day when I flipped on the switch of the TV early one morning on these early one of these early morning shows and they had someone come on and say oh we are now going to give a marvelous course on what a woman should do who's afraid to ask a man out for a date or out to dinner and I thought isn't that interesting here in Los Angeles they certainly need it because these women don't know enough to ask a man out for dinner they always ask them directly to bed <laughs> now on the East Coast I think a lot of the women do need to be uh, more open and, and free and probably need a few hints on how well you've no, seen that yeah. marvelous ad for sherry no you, sherry sherry you know the, the oh and the cocktail, cocktail yeah, sherry yeah. right and now just ask the fellow upstairs down for a glass of sherry it's just quite proper well to actually do. it's not it isn't at all because the second you ask a man out even just because and timothy's the way i have a few friends i go out with and they're just buddies thank mm -hmm. god but i asked a man i didn't know well to come out to dinner with me he'd assume i was trying to pick him up certainly go to bed with him and I don't want that assumption made just because I want to spend time with a man. Because I'm monogamous. I am staying out, of, <laughs> staying out of this entire conversation. This is an absolutely no win conversation. I'm certainly going to get on this conversation more often because it gives me a chance to talk. And usually you're the one that just from the beginning to the end keeps going. And now I have an opportunity to have my voice heard. Unimportant oh, issues. Yeah. Hmm? Unimportant issues. Mm -hmm. Well, it's quite an issue of today's age. Francis, don't you think that the the uh, sexual revolution, excuse the horrible expression. Oh, I don't think it's a horrible expression yeah, which at has all. given more uh, options to women, given more courage to women, confidence to uh, to uh, decide what they want to do. Oh, yeah. Don't you wish you were being brought up now or coming up as... Well, you know, I have five children, ages 18 to 23. Two oldest being girls are 21 and 23. And I've had this discussion with some of the boys, too. They have so many options open to them at such an early age when they're really not ready to handle a lot of it, that my kids, have, uh, we're very fortunate. Our children are very solid, perhaps because they had so much controversy and problems come in an early stage, they had to mature. But among their friends, a lot of these uh, young adults are having real problems on handling all this openness. If they had problems before, which are worse, because they were problems of guilt and secrecy and confusion and ignorance. The problem today, at least, uh, they're out in the open, uh, you can talk about it. Well, yeah, but not necessarily. You take the old-fashioned, the girl, who uh, is would like to go to bed with a young man. And back in the older days before the pill, and when she had, uh, you know, God would come down and strike her dead, or the devil would come up and get her. Um, she had this... Sounds better. <laughs> I'm with the devil. I'll go for that. <laughs> she had this feeling that, gee, I can't go that far, because suppose I get pregnant. Then the poor girl, whether she has the guilt of a religious background, she has the guilt of, gee, I've given myself to somebody and he doesn't care. And then she has to carry that. And I think that's just as bad for the woman, the young woman, as it is for the devil's gonna come up and grab me because she's given the thing she values the most and she's ready and open and young. At and least she can talk about it now. She can talk about yeah, her girlfriends. Her girlfriends that don't go for a creep like that the next time or, or see Marvin Mitchelson or for your <laughs> alimony or there. The ability to openly discuss it. See, there are yeah. many rhythms and you know many stages and uh, many options. And then what, what one person does not necessarily good for the other. The old way was monolithic, keep your legs crossed or we'll kill you forever. Yeah, but then there's Anything another problem that comes. The only acceptable pill was the St. Joseph's aspirin. Uh -huh. Fast tightly between the knees. But then there's another problem that comes along with this. Oh, that's <laughs> cop humor. <laughs> Generally speaking, you can divide the population in any prison anywhere in this country into two parts. One are the convicts. The cons run the prisons, not the guards. And it is because of this room temperature IQ that the guards have. <laughs> now, the convicts are persons who, although they might not have much 
formal institutionalized education generally have a lot of street smarts. They are the kind of person who can put a gun in his fist, walk into the First National Bank and say to 25 people, stick him up. Uh, you are talking to a, and about a very forceful and aggressive uh, dominant personality. That's the convict. He views prison as an occupational hazard. He spends his time in prison after making the best deal he can with the prosecutor to spend the least amount of time there, uh, just figuring out what he did wrong, what mistake, so that when he goes out again, he can do it right the next time and not get caught by the police, okay? Now, that's one half the population. The other half of the population are the prison guards. Now, just ask yourself, what kind of a person would put himself in prison for 30 years? <laughs> Look, here's, here's your typical prison guard is a man who wanted very, very much to be a police officer. He applied, he flunked the test to get in. A few of them actually managed to get through the screening and the test to get in, and of course they get, they get washed out in the academy. Then they try to be firemen. They flunk that too. They can't go back to the farm because their father won't let them play with the machinery because they keep breaking it. <laughs> and finally, out of desperation to avoid starvation, these nitwits become prison guards. <laughs> they like to think of themselves as peace officers. They are not. Never, ever mistake a prison guard for a peace officer or a police officer or anything else. Obviously, uh, we have to have social organizations. I believe in bridge clubs, I believe in families, I believe in friends, I believe in stock groups, I believe in collectives, I believe in corporations, I believe in corporations. Sure, I love, I endorse, endorse all that. I think we, these groups have to make laws which govern traffic lights and every other aspect of our life. But there's one form, see, you, you can drop out of all those, you can move from any of these organizations, even family you can, but there's one form of organization which is involuntary, and that's the modern state. Now, every state in the world, America included, is a mafia. Because once you get in it, they won't let you out. Now, I love America. America is the greatest mafia of them all. But still, uh, they say, uh, we own this turf, and you know, you have to pay extortion fees, it's called taxes, but uh, uh, I, I give no rights to the state. Uh, the state has only the rights that we individuals moving in, in groups together, give it. And there's no God-given uh, uh, obligation on our part to blindly accept the laws of the state. Let's, let's uh, definitely well, restrict them. What I'm doing in my lectures and the debates, and I hope I can get this through to Liddy, is that uh, we've got to give young people hope, we've got to give them programs, we've got to give them courage to take over. Yes, uh, it's very interesting about you and Liddy. He talks about the past, you talk about the future. Uh, what do you offer? What, what can you offer now, here, today? What is the offer that you make? Well, what I'm urging young people to do, and old people too, because you know, you're, oh, you're, as, you're as young as the last time you've really changed your mind, you know, started afresh. But uh, I'm simply pointing out the demographic fact, which is a monolithic fact, that 76 million of them between the ages of 18 and 36 they can control, and they will control America. Okay, but what, what... As the, a political entity, they've what got What blueprint, to, what plan, what, what can somebody grasp onto that Well, basically, help? I'm a cheerleader. It's not for me to give them the plan, except to encourage them to do it. Number one, they don't want war. Number two, they believe in space. For example, uh, do you know that young people spend $8 billion a year, Carol, on video arcade games, those space games? Oh, yes. That's more... That's too for boys. Yeah. That's more money than our grown-ups in Washington spend on the real program. The Russians and the Japanese are spending more on real space programs. Now, space is one of the futures. That's where the energy is. That's where the new frontier is. If we, if we had a program that the kids in the ghetto and the, the young kids that don't have jobs, let's say we have an enormous homesteading of space. And I'm not talking about Star Wars. I'm talking about space platforms, which the Russians already have. I'm talking about using the shuttle, which was designed to be a Greyhound bus. If we had an all-out program to double the, double the uh, uh, lifespan, to move out into space, to offer jobs and new techniques. There'd be a sense of, of hope, and, and, and Americans, particularly young Americans, need a frontier. So Although, you're a hope seller? I'm, yes, I'm a hope seller, uh, but my hope is scientific hope. It's based upon projections from NASA. But what do you do about it? Well, I go around, uh, I give about 40 college lectures a year. I'm on uh, radio talk shows. I write, I've got two books coming out this year. 
And all my books are based upon scientific facts which give hope to individuals to uh, stand up and control their destiny. Timothy Leary is just not a household word well, right I'm now. I'm not worried about that at all. That's the least of my problems. And I'm wondering I'm if... I'm a scientist and I'm not trying to be a pop star. I'm not well, then why are you... Uh, I'm publishing my books. I'm getting my signals uh, out to a, a large number of people. But well, your uh, act is pretty personal. showbiz uh, with, with um, Mr. Liddy. Well, thank you. I hope that it's entertaining and electrifying and that uh, it keeps people's attention. Oh, you are drawn to showbiz. I, I love, uh, I think that uh, DNA operates in showbiz. I think these flowers are showbiz. I think that attractiveness and the ability to, uh, to get attention is part of the function of being a teacher or part of the function of being a human being. I still don't have and any uh, concrete... I must tell you, dear, I, I, yeah. the, con you, the concrete... You, oh, my dear, what? I've got to say this again, and I'll repeat it. The number one factor in politics and science in, in religion today is demography. It's the new science. And the first, you're going to hear that in the next 10 years, you're going to hear it. You heard it oh, here I... on this program first, that age, demography, baby boom is the key to the future. May I say and that I've heard that ready for many, it, many times. It's very, very important. Very, very interesting the key sentence. to everything that's happening. But it is not the key to tell somebody to be sure that your minister was born after 1946, to vote for somebody who was born after... Oh. It's divisive. It, it, uh, you're it doing again what you did sure, in the 60s. But, uh, that, that will and force the older people... And how did your message get distorted? But that's going to force the older people. If I were a person over, uh, if I'm born before 46 and I heard this message, and I thought that some young people are listening, I'd get my act together and I'd listen to the younger out people. Out of fear? Out of interest, out of self-interest, uh, self out of curiosity. Uh, I will have... Curiosity. I would, uh, then Dr. Timothy Leary, since you were born after 1946, uh, mm -hmm. what do you really have to say? Why should I listen to you? Why should my sons listen to you? The younger group doesn't get off on Frank Sinatra or on Elvis Presley or on the Beatles or the so forth. Now, when I was in prison, for example, as I've gone, gone through life, I could always tell the age of a man's first orgasm by the kind of music that they liked. And, uh, now, I had the good fortune that when I was 40 years old, I um, started taking reimprint drugs. So uh, I have lost my virginity and I have. Uh, Reinactivated my sexual circuit uh, in the early 60s. It was Miles Davis, Sketches in Spain. I've taken LSD at least 50 times behind the Beatles Rolling Stones, so uh, uh, I've right aside the, their access goes. Oh, I haven't given them up my Benny Goodman, and no one's ever going to compare with Helen Farr singing All the Things You Are, right? <laughs> you, if you really want to get off. Tim came to Harvard, which I suppose is the most crucial nodal point in any discipline in American academia and he blew it wide open. He said, we're gonna stop lying to people, we're gonna stop manipulating people, we're going to make our um, medium reflect our message. And it was one of the big bombshells that started humanistic psychology. Its importance cannot be overstated. Once you understand that you are hardwired genetic imprinted, only then, can you transcend it and not be a victim of it? And I used to go around to cocktail parties, I'd say to people, oh, what percent of your behavior do you think is a uh, robot? Well, the real dumb ones would say, zero percent. Oh, Gordon Liddy, I'm master of my face. Ah. Yeah. Right on, Gordon. Yeah. I know what traveling with Tim did to me. So I have some suspicions about what traveling with Tim is doing to Gordon. Up until <laughs> uh, up until the CIA captured him, he was really cool. When he turned in all the dudes that helped him escape from CNC, he turned into a snitch. Well, you know, there's, there's one thing I want to say that he says that, that that is not true. What he says is that the government put that label on him and they stamped that on his jacket to try to get him, to, to scare him into turning snitch, and that he never did. And, and just 
you know, to be fair to him, I want to point out what he says. That's I wasn't possible. there. I wasn't that's there. very probable. Well, you, yeah. 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 So how did you feel about going after Timothy Leary? Were you afraid of him as a person? No. no. As an innovator? No matter, not only that, Tim, Tim Leary, i got to say this for him, that when I busted him, he was really cool. I mean, he never, he never, uh... He's probably high. Or anything else. <laughs> probably <laughs> tripping. <laughs> well, be. As a matter of fact, he, he this did isn't say, happening, man. It's all the same dream. When, when, I, when I came in, he said there were laser beams coming out of my eyes. Hey, Gordon, so, uh, you know what one of the guys said? Uh, your writing abilities must uh, coincide with your breaking in abilities. And when you got caught. Touche. <laughs> 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 in, in defense of my breaking in ability, as distinguished from my writing ability, I'd like to say that uh, if you took all the different. <laughs> places I've broken into, starting in 1958, my batting average is about 900. That's pretty good. I wish mine was that good. <laughs> now, when I was disillusioned was the year 1960, in the electoral contest between Richard Nixon on the one hand and John Fitzgerald Kennedy on the other. And at the time, I was a special agent of the FBI assigned to investigate the activities of those people who, amongst other things, were charged with, allegedly, stealing the election by that great American practice of stuffing ballot boxes in Texas and Cook County, Chicago, and other such things. And I was a young man at the time, and I said, heaven for friend, look what's going on here. <laughs> and then, of course, there was 1963 or 64, when it was Barry Goldwater's place that was broken into, and there the wiretap was put in. And, of course, that was page 23 news. Every four years, these kinds of activities take place. How are they justified? You engage in combat in an arena by the rules that obtain in that arena, arena when you arrive. You don't make those rules up. But you had better learn them rapidly if you intend to win, if you want to go into the Roman Colosseum against the armed and armored gladiators, unarmed and unarmored, be my guest. But do not do so under the illusion that you will have any chance of defeating them. You're implying that LSD is not as popular today. The no, 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 no. Are... I'm not implying anything. I'm really asking a very yeah. honest question. Do you think that LSD research is still a valuable scientific tool? Absolutely, it's a scandal that all our government has done in the last 20 years is to try to find a painkiller that won't make you feel good. I mean, think about it. Fortunately, young people are now taking over the laboratories. Those born between uh, 46 and, six and, six and 64, they're now at the ages of 18 and 36. They're just coming in, you know, as, as Wozniak uh, and Job did the uh, computer. Um, there are many, many, many young people moving into the laboratories. We're getting more and more good drugs coming out every day, new, new versions. Uh, so um, there will be much more research done. See, it's all, I have to go back again. Nobody, nobody born before 1946 can understand, you know, any drug except booze. Because that's the way they lost their virginity. What's really, you know, good enough for, granddad is good enough for me. But uh, everyone born after 1946 knows that booze is about the worst kind of, you know, aphrodisiac. You're going to get into that. And when these young people take over the laboratories, you know, listen, in 1988, would be 76 million young kids, baby boomers, holding the country, you know, in their hand. You, they're going to they're gonna decriminalize and legalize marijuana, and they'll, oh, come on, there'll be more money put into brain drug research than, and, and, and life extension research than there is in weapons. Thank you. A firearm is an inert object. Had I a loaded revolver right now, I could cock it, put it on this stage, and walk away, and 2,000 years could go by, and nothing will happen whatsoever. What has to happen is human agency. Someone has to pick it up and use it. That use can be for good or for ill, like everything else. What we need is human control, not handgun or firearm control. Your name. Uh, Carol, I'd like to just make a one-cent comment there. I find it curious the, um, that Gordon thinks that St. Pope Innocent III, they've tried to control gu guns, crossbows, and weapons. They can't, so therefore, let it happen. Gordon, they've been, uh, the, 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 every pope and most every bureaucrat in history has tried to control drugs. It hasn't worked. So the same argument that you used for gun control I accept 
for drugs. What has happened to these priorities that should come out in this debate tonight? These are the things that are really going on. Not whether, not whether you can smoke dope or not, or take a little bit of acid, or shoot something up in your arm, or kill a man because he murdered somebody else, which I could agree with myself. But the real important issues here are, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. Kill for Jesus! Kill for Jesus! Jeremiah, I'm going to ask you God will one day go, Larry. Almighty God will cast people into hell. The scripture talks about binding their hands, and you'll be smoking a joint when God casts you into hell. And you ought to repent instead of trying to smear me and make a joke and act like a clown, which is how you've debated Mr. Liddy all night. You ought to deal with the basic fact that the God of judgment will judge you one day and will throw you into hell and will kill you if you don't repent. That's what you better come to grips with. All right, uh, Gordon. But what the basic thing is this, Mr. Liddy. What the hell happened to the Friar training? Cool it. Let's talk mellow, mellow and uh, get, uh, get Gordon's let me, in. Let me, uh, let me respond to the gentleman. What I, what I said yesterday was not that Christians had killed more people. What I said was that my study of history has led me to believe that there has been more human blood spilled on the face of this earth in the name of one God or another or one organized religion or another than for any other reason. I didn't single out the Christians for it. It's not a debate, my friends. This is an encounter between two alien uh, groups of people. And we must try to make... I feel that I'm, I'm not a leader, Gordon. I have no followers. I am, because your generation has no leaders. I am your cheerleader. <laughs> and sometimes I like to consider myself an ambassador from those born after 1946. I have, sociobiologically, I must tell you, see, I have changed species in midstream. <laughs> Although I was born uh, long before Mr. Liddy, I caught on. The future belongs to the young. So I have, uh, I'm a traitor to my genetic gene pool. Individual. If you were the only human being on the face of this earth, what need would you have of laws, rights? You're the only person here. It'd be totally irrelevant, wouldn't it? But you'd still have your morality, wouldn't you? Morality comes from the individual nature of man. Law, rights, and the rest of it, from his social nature. And so, we have two distinctive academic disciplines. The discipline of morality, which is called ethics. The discipline of law, which is called jurisprudence.